so um, one of the major reasons why I came here is to probably you know share my story. So ground rules, this is not a broadcast. Um, I'm trying to hopefully share uh, my journey of how why I started the company, um, how there were challenges in scaling, and also maybe you know I want to use this as a learning platform to get some of your thoughts. So at any point in time, put your hands up if you want to stop me and ask questions. And this needs to be a discussion, not a session, right? So please, please do put up your hands. I know we don't know each other at all, but I would love to change that by the end of the session. Yeah? So, very fancy title, uh, the start of global consulting company in Salesforce. Um, it's just been 4.5 years since I started, and uh, I'll go through some of the steps that I took and some things that I learned. But one thing that I really knew is that I always wanted to do something I really loved. So, uh, we were actually talking outside as well um, like, how do you travel so much, and how do you keep your energy up? The simple answer, which I did not know two years ago, is that keep doing the thing that you love. It could be farming potatoes, right? It could be, you know, um, designing fashion clothes. It could be Salesforce consulting, right? For me, it is this. I love to wake up every day, go into a business, figure out how they do it and how they're successful, and see if I can accelerate that and do the social platform. I'm going to show you one of my favorite slides all about me. Right? So, serial entrepreneur, what marketing team loves to say that. Um, but one of the things is also, this journey has given me a lot of opportunities. It has given me uh, access to people and technology and opportunities that I would never have had if I had not taken this risk. And I tell you, this is a risk because at that time that when I started, especially when I was in Asia, not a lot of people were doing what I was doing. And at a heart, I am a Salesforce developer. I started on the platform almost 11 years ago. Um, started working for a company called Author House or Penguin Books, you might have heard. Um, they, were, they were an actual trailblazer. They were using the platform like crazy. Uh, I got to work with some amazing companies like Facebook, Google, Workday. Um, but I always wanted to write code because that's where I felt you know, the power of the platform was. I'm pretty sure Seth so wouldn't want me to tell me that. It's all admin friendly, but um, you know, I, even today I find an excuse to write code. Be it uh, Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, uh, Microsoft APIs, Power Cloud, we talk about. Uh, I always try to find a reason to write code because that's also something that I really love. Uh, yeah, not a lot of certifications, like Rad, but I have five. Um, you can find me on Twitter, I'm very active. So find me to ask questions even after this, right? It would be not very easy to ask while we're talking. So some of the highlights um, of the journey. We were, I was actually thinking, what do I say were the turning points of my life during this journey, right? And it's an ongoing journey, but my company and me as a person, uh, I, I'm born out of community. I was a Salesforce uh, developer group leader initially, um, and I was initially a C sharp developer. That's how I know the world code that I was doing. But yeah, um, the publishing company that I talked about was very intense because at that time, this was back in 2007 uh, in India, nobody wanted to touch Salesforce, the architects of the company. You know, like this is a scripting language. Why would I waste my time? I wanted to be a C sharp architect, right? But I was fresh out of college, I was actually still in college. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, young and stupid. So I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll take on Salesforce. And what I found out was, it was uh, and also, uh, fundamentally, I'm a very lazy guy. So to do stuff on Salesforce, it was much more easier than doing it on C Sharp because I don't have to worry about DLLs and servers and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I fell in love with the platform. Um, I had a very good exposure with that company because they trusted me with architectural positions, which was fun at first, not scary later. So, uh, because I was 20, 20, I think, 2021, and they were making me do architectural decisions on some of the stuff that, you know, was changing how they do business at that time. So, I got scared, I left the company, right? Uh, and I wanted to actually learn more, uh, because I knew that was my path, but I wanted to learn more, so I 
flew from south of India to the north of India. There's a place called Delhi. Um, so I, you know, joined the team there. Um, again, started building a local group there again um, because what I found at that time it was just a PDF for Salesforce. How many of you have been working on a social platform for more than six years? More than six years. Seven years. Yeah. So all you all know, trailer did not exist. Okay? It was just some workshops, some HTML, some PDFs that you have to train on yourself. So the reason I started the developer group was because I found people who loved the same thing that I loved and wanted to you know, share and learn and you know, share that experience. So first time in Kochi, which is Canada, I started a group there. And then when I moved my job to North India, I started a group there as well, which gave me more confidence knowing that, yes, this is a platform that I can invest my career in. Uh, and also gain the right confidence. That's something that I really got. I was a very shy guy, but yes. So I also had to make a decision at that time. So the company that I was working with did both C Sharp and Salesforce. And everybody that I knew said C Sharp is .NET is something you don't let go. Right? It is a very stable job. You can get multiple jobs. Don't go to the Salesforce economy, right? But I loved it, so I took that risk. And luckily, it was a turning point for me because um, I was really good at what I did. I love what I did. Um, at the age of 21, I had a 30 member team that was allocated to me. And most of the guys were like 45 or 35, and they had to report to me, which is awkward. But I learned something, which was I was a very temperament guy. I used to get angry very fast. I used to, you know, I don't tolerate the other. Right? So I wanted to be perfect. I'm like, why can't you do this thing? Um, and what I learned, which is so days, is one of the biggest things that I think helped me scale is the temper, is empathy, um, which is going to be a repeating thing that I'm going to talk about because success, to be very honest, can never be achieved alone. And that's something I learned really fast because managing a team member 30, uh, expectations were high. And I cannot be that arrogant guy who can just say, go do your job, right? I had to find a different way. My, I had very good mentors who taught me that you have to be composed. You have to be the calm person in the room if you wanted to get an outfit. If something blew up, which it did, um, one of my team members, um, there was an airline company that we were working for, which I don't want to name, um, they deleted 10,000 uh, B2B accounts from Salesforce, from production, overnight, by running some code. I was furious because I was, you know, uh, on a Saturday night, they were like, yeah, you know, come to office because the customer's gonna sue us, right? <laughs> uh, so I brought in everybody and I was shouting them. I was like, why did you do this? And I was 21, right? Uh, but my mentor uh, basically walked into the room, uh, talked to me, and I was very emotional, and then, um, you know, went in the room with the developer and kind of was so calm that he said, yep, no problem, let's not uh, talk about what happened, how do we fix this? Then, okay, what is the customer going to say? Look at the different aspects, how can we make sure that they don't get pissed off? How can we make sure their business is not fresh? It might sound really simple, but it was an eye-opening time for me because I figured out he got that to, like, you know, situation resolved, just not a technical situation, it's a very political, very emotional and human situation got resolved by being calm, which is something that I still cherish till day and I'm always trying to be that. Uh, but yeah, that is what leading a team number 30 taught me. Uh, and I also learned uh, a lot on how teams work, how estimations work, uh, which is very important for starting a consulting company because as a consultant, uh, I tell my team as well, you're like a doctor, right? Um, your customers are going to be having pain and they're going to be shouting at you or they're not being, they're, they won't be satisfied, they won't give you the right information. But it's your job to be calm, know your subject, because a doctor who does not know the subject cannot advise you. So you go into a million dollar, billion dollar business and tell them how to do their business through Salesforce, you need to be super calm and you also need to know what you're talking about. So that is something that really helped me. Part of that also was my stint at Kuba. Uh, anybody know Groupon? All right, perfect. So I was the youngest architect at Groupon uh, when Groupon acquired a company here in Europe called uh, City Deals, I think. Um, 
that was one of the largest org words in the world for Salesforce. Um, very honored to be part of that uh, you know, architect panel. What it taught me differently was in the other company, the second company where the massive war happened, it was a consultancy where I got to learn the breadth of technology, right? We need the sales card, another product, we need the service card, the e-commerce card, we need the app. But visual force, I learned the breadth of it, but at Groupon, which is a private company, we went deep into the platform. We had in almost every known limit of Salesforce back then, where you had queries, and you had um, you know index character limits. I don't know how many of you remember that. We hit that five times over. So what that taught me was to go deeper into the platform. And the other thing that changed my life was becoming a Salesforce MVP. How that happened, which was awesome for me, but I never aimed at it. I didn't even know such a program existed. It was by sharing that knowledge back. What you learned today, right? You are sharing your knowledge back to the community, helping others succeed, right? Uh, you know, Bobby is helping organizers, right? Some of you have spoken at the user group before. That's all I did. I basically was on that forum. Um, I wanted to genuinely help people, um, wanted to solve a problem because I always face a problem with somebody helping out. And the user group, where you, you know, you love what you do and share that knowledge. This is really important to me because. That helped me amplify my voice. We got a lot more avenues to help. Why I'm telling you this, this story is because there are different points, and different points of learning that I personally cherish, uh, which is how my company is structured. So, just to give you a little bit, this slide is outdated already. We have close to 250 developers across six countries, nine locations. We have 350 projects across all the globe. We are a platinum partner as of yesterday. And that is one of the highest achievements in the Salesforce partner ecosystem that you might know of. So, this, in, and this was happening in the last 4.5 years. I just started the company 4.5 years ago. It's because I was also trying to figure out what is that success metric because I want to help my team also start their own companies and succeed. So, that's the reason we have this slide over, right? Uh, what we do, uh, we only work on Salesforce. We're pure for Salesforce. One of the key things that we have, the reason why we have nine offices across the board, which I think is not 10, 11, is because, and this slide actually, as I said, I was lazy, so I didn't change it. This was the session that I also did in uh, the Ski Force um, in Austria. So we brought that slide over because we got good feedback. So since then, right, since Austria, which was, when was that? In April. In April, right? So since April, this has changed. Our team grew by 100%. We started four more offices, right? We completed 100 more projects since April. That's the scale that we're at because this is what we share fundamentally. Um, and also, when I talk to my customers my team, uh, and I think we were having a discussion yesterday as well. What is at the core, right? At the core is not what we do or how we do it, it is why we do it. Right? And that's the kind of team member that we have around us as well. Why are we doing what we do? We want to actually make a difference in how people do business and solve it through Salesforce. Right? So we made sure that within our exec team, our first customers are our employees, right? our team members. We make sure everything that we can give them, we're, we're actually, sometimes people say we're spoiling them, but anything and everything that's possible to make their lives comfortable, that's what we do because they take care of my customers ultimately, right? So um, we try to imbibe that sense of ownership, which is not easy at that scale or at that pace, but never give up, right? And that's one of the things, again, we're discussing outside, um, coming back to the point of if you don't do what you love, you will never have that energy to do it. So if you are planning to start something, if you are trying to take that first step, make sure that it's something that you really like to do. Even if it's not going to be profitable at first, completely fine. So I'll give you a little bit of insight as well on that. Um, when I started, uh, it was just me and a developer that I hired just on phone call within five minutes. Right? We started the company because um, the reason I started also was starting for this because um, the Indian dream is to go and settle in the US. Right? Um, so we basically, um, I had an offer from Google, I had an offer from, um, I don't know, Cloud Sherpas, they got acquired by IBM or Accenture. 
um, and a couple of other companies, right? Um, when I was making that decision to say, hey, let me go, you know, follow the footsteps and go settle back in the US, Google, who would say no, right? The offer was like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars back then, five, six years ago. Uh, and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna take. But I did some calculations, uh, and also one of the reasons I stayed back is because of the community, because I've spent you know a lot of years developing the community in India, which is it's amazing now, but it was not like that initially. There, there was nobody. The community was like one thing. Economically, I did the math, and I felt if I earned 25% of that in the US, in India, I had a little bit of change. Uh, that was one thing. And also, I did not just want to do the same thing over and over again. So, um, the other part also is I was very confident that I can get a job. Even if I fail, I know I can get a job. So, to me, that was like a no-brainer, right? So, I, I told all the offers that I had, say that, no, I'm not going to join, I'm going to try to do something on my own. Luckily, which is something also a little stress. Apart from knowledge, apart from time, there's also luck that plays a lot of big factors to be very honest. It's not just a formula. So luckily, all the four offers except Google told me that they will join me as my customers so that they can work with me, which was a beautiful thing that was happening Europe, right? So first day, two people, we have 48 hours of work per day, right? So, um, we were able to scale really quickly. Within a week, we were like 10. Uh, three months, 50, and we just basically kept going over there. So, um, yeah, as I said, luck definitely plays a factor. And the things that you see here, um, there's a reason why I do this. As I said, I love working with the best people out there. And my goal is to make sure, one, we have access to customers, perfect. But the only reason we start a new office is if we find amazing team members. It's not about customers or it's not about anything else. If you find the right people, the right energy, the right drive to succeed, that's when we start new office. And that's our mantra. All the offices that you see here is because of amazing leaders. There is one leader who, you know, will want to work as hard as I do. But I never let them. I want to be an hard working person. But that passion, right? That's why we start. So we are really blessed with a good team that helps us get. That is another thing. Apart from, as I said, time to love, people, surround yourself with amazing people. That is, I cannot stress how important it is, especially in consulting, because we don't sell anything. We sell time and imagination, right? That's what we do. We don't sell machines, we don't sell product, we sell time and imagination. Surrounding yourself with the right people is success. Because if you have a bad day, we're talking about you when like, we have a burnout. There will be amazing people around you who will lift you up. And especially in our job, as you all know, you might not be working eight hour jobs. You might be working 12 hours, then you go back home, you get email. It's a constant thing that's part of our industry. If you have a day you cannot be 100%, there needs to be somebody who can lift you up. So surround yourself with amazing people who will never fail, right? And, uh, what makes me come to work every day, which I did cover, and you can see this is a theme. I'm not very structured, so I'll be, you know, between slides. Uh, I love what I do. Very simple. I really, really love what I do. And even at our size, we currently, and I'll share the numbers, we gross um, annually for a company of our size. I think the last audit in the industry was around 16 to 17 million dollars in revenue which everybody says is a good number for a company of our size. That does not mean that we only work with the top tier guys. And I'll show you some of the logos. You would have seen Emirates, National Geographic, um, you know, Salesforce.com, Mark Benioff, they're all my customers, right? But the best or the most favorite project that I ever did was the potato. <laughs> one license, one enterprise license. In the UK. Amazing in this This guy, he was, a, he was an older gentleman who did not know anything about technology, but he also loved what he did, which is farming. Um, and he had, he had a good business. Uh, he was selling to Walmart and all the other big guys. But he was not able to keep up with you know, the, uh, the demands, the request, or they had the grading system of how potatoes are. So the potatoes that you see in your top uh, stores, are 800 potatoes, which is probably 30% of their produce. 
then there's beepering and the rest is actually blown away. So what he wanted to do um, was slightly innovative, which is he has a community around him and he wanted to sell direct, right? So the A brick and the B brick are already contracted for, and the rest, which is probably 40 to 50 percent of his produce, is usually thrown away, and he didn't like it, right? Uh, so he was even if he sold it for one cent, it is still profit for him, and it's again uh, reducing waste. So we use Salesforce uh, to basically list out all community members uh, nearby how often they buy groceries. Um, so based on that pattern, we basically recommended orders to them by email or text. They can just say yes, tell them you'll be scheduled, and his, I think his um, nephew was basically going on a bike to you know, uh, give them out, and they paid via cash, right? They didn't care about that, but the scheduling part and tracking their customer behavior is something that he still has a lot of use cases, a lot of services, but still one license because he's the only guy, right? I love that part of it. So that is something that uh, brings back of why we do this, right? It's not about just the money, it's about the change. You can change how he does business and change that community, which is absolutely something that I love. So again, please stop me in between, otherwise I keep talking. Uh, one thing that I really realized while we were building this business. Of course, I had a good partner um, after a year who joined my business as a COO. Um, we did Sri Lanka, we did uh, Dubai, US, with basic commerce there. But what we found out, and I'm pretty sure all of you know this as well, as you scale a business, especially the consulting business, the people who really work hard are the people who get a lot more work and who get stretched out compared to the slackers that, you know, might not want to pick up the loan, right? And that's very common, right? Um, what happened was we had some of our top guys leave because they were being stretched out and the customer kept asking them, okay, like, hey, we want this guy, we don't want anybody else, and that's how we service our customers, you know? Um, and ultimately, some people got sick, um, and we found out that this is not a model that we, we don't want to be a workshop. Right? So we did some really crazy stuff to be sustainable, which is we fired 50% of our staff, which is scary. Especially I didn't sit there for months. But we had to. But making those decisions is why we were able to scale. So um, I talked to a potato farmer as well, he said the same thing. Like if you want a good crop, don't worry about losing the bad ones, right? It will grow again, right? So sustainability is not some mantra Accenture follows or Facebook follows or something else. It is very, very unique. Every business is like a fingerprint. So for us, just to share my story, um, we had to make changes with HR, the way we hired. Um, we had to make changes with how we operated because um, ours was not a very conducive environment because it was high stress for the people who really performed because more work was coming. Of course, they were incentivized, but the work life balance was not there because we were growing at that pace. So our hiring methodology changed, we dropped a few customers, uh, and the thing that I was not really good at, as a CEO I should have been, is the finance, right? Uh, I hated doing taxes and uh, I never wanted to compute anything, right? I would just give it to somebody and say, please figure it out. But one of the things I had to was, as part of my role is to understand what every cent in my business is going to do, right? So. That was a personal journey that I had to take. So as part of scaling business, what I also figured out was that if you are running a company, always look at it as when are you going to go backwards. So as a CEO, one of your main jobs is to be paramount. Is to be paramount to figure out what can fail and then fix it. So one of the things was that, which is uh, I knew if we continue this way, we're going to fail and all my guys are going to leave, right? So, we were kind of about that, we did some rash decisions, which turned out pretty good because they were calculated risks. So, monitoring finance, monitoring um, work lifestyle was very important to build our consultancy because it was scaled in that pace. So, to put this in a more structured way, this is what my marketing team would say, which is 
strategize, target, you know, put in vision, put in ideas, put in the right location. Location does not mean a physical location, it is where you apply these strategies, right? Sometimes we also felt a developer who was really, really good in solving problems. We ended up making that person a team, right? We were forcing them to be in a position where they're not going to be successful, which is a very common thing that would happen. So for us, for our strategy, we basically did analyze uh, how and where our strengths lie, where we want to play to our strengths, right, with, with my team. So that is one thing that we were very, very careful about. And then make sure if you don't want to be a team leader, we are not going to push you. Even though you are in the network, that's completely fine. We want to make sure it's a long-term stuff, play to your strength. So, uh, and also it's not intentional. As you scale, let's say today Bob is running this group. Tomorrow, if there's a group coming in, um, let's say a mule group, I'll be probably be asked to say, hey, can you run that as well? Or can you do more groups uh, or more meetups? Because he's doing it more often. If, you, if you're performing, you will be visible. So more responsibilities come to you. And you will sometimes be put in positions where you're not going to be succeeding. And that is something that we face and we correct it and we're very, very cognizant about making sure that we don't do that again. Um, yeah, marketing, I cannot stress how important this is. If you're a consultancy, tell your story. If you, if you have a product, tell your story because if you don't tell your story, nobody else is going to talk about you. So make sure every step of the way, if you get a chance to tell your story at a gathering or at an event or on a blog, wherever it is, be your own cheerleader. Right? If you are your own cheerleader, people hear you and then talk about it. That's what happens. If you look at any company, that's how it is. Right? There are people talking, we can talk about that. But yeah, and the reason thing, this one, the vision piece, is something that I never figured out until a year and a half ago. Because I never felt like, people used to ask me, what's your vision with uh, Dateworks? Why are you doing a consulting business? I never had an answer. I definitely did some bullshit, which is, of course, uh, you know, what you need to do sometimes. I did say, oh, we want to change the world. And, you know, uh, we're going to be the number one uh, you know, consulting company there. But unless you have a vision that, People can relate to it, and if it's not genuine, nobody's gonna follow you. So, especially in a consulting company, you are people and a price. So, stick to what people can believe in. Stick to what people will spend their life in. Because as a company, let's say you have 100 people, one person is 100, 1% of the company. But if you look at a developer, a person who is working with you, 100% of your career is invested in your company. So making sure that you have a purpose of what you're doing was very important. That's something that really helped us again scale much faster. So yeah, um, yeah, the parts. This is again now I talked about the beginning of how what are the first principles on what we build a team. Now the second piece I want to talk about is how you scale or. What is your practice, right? Like people tell us, let's build a practice, right? Practice is basically the repetition of core ideas. And one of the things that we always wanted to make sure as, as we scale and we brought on more people is one, everybody might not be an expert in everything, right? And that's one of the things that we did initially that um, if you're a sales person, you know, yeah, take the service cloud project, sales project, you know, community project, everything, right? But we soon realized, especially in the sales world, every three months new things are coming in, just to play catch up is very difficult. So we created structures to basically have how do we fill knowledge groups. So we did specializations. We divided our teams into very specific clouds that we had expertise on, came up with learning plans to make sure that you're always the master, the best at what you do, right? Instead of diversifying. So there was something that was, uh, there was a little bit of friction with the team, but ultimately they saw it. So filling the knowledge gaps is very important because you talk to customers who are going to invest thousands of dollars in you. And if you're not the expert that you're talking to, you're not going to have other people who are specialists. So specialization, filling the knowledge gaps is very important. The relationship piece. Um, I can't tell you the number of times where we've done a project just for relationship. Because it might not be easy initially, and that's why this piece is in the middle, which is 
sometimes you might have to do a project or spend some time or hire somebody which might not sound physically responsible from an economic perspective. But if you find the right reasons and if you trust that relationship, if you think that relationship can grow, that would also be one of your pillars. Um, recently, we did a project with, the, okay, we didn't even know this guy. This guy was having his own NGO um, and said, hey, listen, I have no money, but I really want to help um, these people. Could you spare like two developers for a month? Which would equate to somewhere around $25,000 for us, right? Two developers full time. Um, we loved what he did and we said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna help you do that. That guy was an investor in uh, one of the largest companies out there. You might, you guys know PwC, right? PwC, he was an investor there, he was an influencer there. We finished the project. We just recently got, I think three weeks ago, uh, a PO from PwC, which okay. is a massive team just to do a couple of projects that they have. So, uh, which, which again, might place a factor, um, but it is also that fundamentally you do something um, because you trust in that person and not just expect it from a money perspective. Like, oh, what am I going to get out of this, right? Sometimes you might have to do that, but most of the time it's trusting people in the relationship. That's going to help you out. Something we learned really, really fast was no two projects are alike. Um, same sales for projects um, always, they, you know, could go a different way. So what we taught our team was never to be complacent. Don't think that, yes, you know what's gonna happen, so assume this and then let's go ahead. It's gonna be much, much more difficult later. So we always ask our people to think, this is, imagine this is your first sales product. This is your first customer every single time. Ask all the questions you don't know about the industry. Don't assume that even though we have Adidas and Nike, they do business completely different. Right? So don't assume that's what's going to be. If you have doubts, ask them, right? So that's something that we always try to help with the team. Um, this is more for the sales side of things. Um, you know, we, when we talk, especially uh, some of the new people who are trying to, how many of you want to start your own business, by the way? some of the stuff that's never been talked about, which is, Salesforce also sends you business. If you're part of a partner program, Salesforce will send you business, right? Um, it is based on, one, if you have the expertise. Second, cost is definitely going to be a factor. The business that comes from Salesforce is not going to be your most profitable business, trust me. I know it's important, but yeah, we're not going to say problem. I mean, this is just my experience, right? Um, but you do this again for the relationship, for the logos, the long run, practice for them. Um, also, when we did this, right, a lot of like, another luck that we had was before we started the sales partnership, which was just a one year ago, um, most of, I would say 99% of our business was inbound. People knew us um, and, you know, they heard of us, other customers talk about us, and basically, they gave us business, right? At that time, our sales cycle was simple. We just said, all right, Mr. Customer, what do you need? Yes, I need a community. So it says, all right, no problem, we'll get two developers, we'll get it done, right? So we used to sell services, right? So what Salesforce partnership taught me was what we call a greenfield implementation. A business that does not even know Salesforce exists, you go and tell them, don't worry, we're gonna be everything all right, you know, uh, we're going to sell or transform your business. These pieces, initially we didn't fail, right, even in the sales cycle. Um, because we were selling services, because that's what we knew to do. We'd say, hey, go to the boxes. Don't worry, it's going to take you five hours to get this done. But that's when I learned this most important thing, which is empathy. Think from the other CEO's shoes. What are they looking for? Are they, do they really care if you put two developers or five developers? They don't really care. What are the outcomes that you're going to get and how much is it going to cost you? Very simple. So that's the language we started speaking. And that's why we're one of the very, very few partners. We're probably the only partner. Within a year, we went from registered uh, partner to platinum. So even if you see, this is Silver Consulting Partner over here, which is in April, the platinum as of yesterday. 
right? So because we sold outcomes, from a sales perspective, that is easier to buy and easier to understand, and that's what people care. If you can tell me that, hey, this is what I'm going to get to, this is where I'm going to increase your sales by X percentage, and you commit to that, they really don't care if you do visual cameras. They don't really care if you do lighting web components. I don't care, right? Just get me that outcome. And that's the line of business that I had to run because this is my first thing. So selling outcomes was very phenomenal for us. ABC, I'm pretty sure everybody knows, always been closing. This is an inside thing. You know, customers love to your fairy tales. Um, you can tell them, don't worry, we'll bring you Einstein, we'll bring you Tesla, whatever it is, right? So always try to keep it simple. Like, make sure your customer, that's who, they, you're there to protect them, right? So, something so curious, you just said, uh, our, our, our bonus, our bonus that uh, you know, your business will go with the echoes and up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, since you are coming from a developer world, as myself, yes. how you can say that this will happen? As a, as a developer perspective. Good question. So, you must be really liking that. Absolutely, I'll tell you that answer. It's a good question. So, the question is, you're a developer and you love from a developer background. How can you guarantee a customer that your business is going to go 8% out, right? And that's one of the reasons why this slide is in the middle and not at the beginning. You will definitely need experience. You will need to be observant of what change you make is impacting your business how. So if you think just like a developer while you're being a developer, that's going to be much harder for you to grasp. So one of the things, again, me having good mentors helped me is I understood the bigger picture. To, okay, what, why are we doing this? What is the reason that I'm helping you do this? And then, ultimately, it also come back, comes back to math. So if I know that um, my customer has seven people in the sales team, or 10 people in the sales team, they do, um, so I'll give you an example. Um, I don't know if this company exists here. Um, it's called CF Tires, like our mission, and there's a company in India called CF Tires. They sell tires, right? So, um, what they did was, the target for salespeople was they sell four tires a day and have five meetings. Okay, this was the target. And over our discovery, what we found out was most of the people were not meeting the account plan, what they call the PJP, right, journey plans. We, we did discovery. You can't just walk into the customer first thing you say, I'm going to increase 8%, that's not going to happen. That is a result of us understanding your business really well. We did discovery with them, we found out that their salespeople could actually have more meetings and can sell more tires because they're not maximized. They don't have a tool to tell them that. So what we did was told them that, hey, what we're all we're gonna do is increase the number of sales for each salesperson by one more tire, and we're gonna increase the meeting by one more meeting per day as a target. We did some math uh, around that, and basically we figured out if it's probably going to be increasing by 15%, if we told the customer we can increase at least 6%, right? Because it's a combination of math, understanding that it doesn't really more, well, for sure. So it is not easy, it's more of the complicated stuff, but I'm happy to show you the numbers if you want to see how that can be done. But again, yeah, experience matters. And to end you that story, we increased it by one tire sales in one meeting. We increased their sales by 15%, and we were actually compensated by the increase in percent. We're not compensated for doing the project. So they said, if you reach these outcomes, we'll give you, uh, I think, 40% of the difference for one year. We made at least 120 times the product cost because even they didn't know they had such a good potential. So sometimes uh, working that math and making sure you can sell that piece uh, becomes over experience for sure, but it would work out. Um, so this model is called gain sharing. If you Google it, you'll understand the formula of that. Um, gain sharing models basically help you put them out of the Yeah. I, I just want to ask, how do you bridge, because all of these out outcomes would require some business knowledge, how do you bridge the gap between being a developer to having the knowledge to, to run a business? Surround yourself with the right people. So I do have industry experts who are part of that industry. We have guys who have like 10, 15 years of automotive industry experience who we do bring in, right? As a developer and the experience that we have, yes, you can push it to an extent, 
But again, uh, that was a very big deal. So we had uh, industry consultants who basically walked in, sat with us through discoveries, played on our side to work out the plan. Because uh, it, you know, sometimes it's not easy. Again, it's just like learning salesforce. Understanding that business industry is probably a two or three time thing. So once you're in a meeting for, let's say, a restaurant business, and you do that two or three times, you understand how that business works, right? You can talk that language. So it comes over time, but initially, so for some big deals or something that is very critical, I would recommend bringing somebody who knows what they're talking about. And that's where, again, filling those knowledge gaps, right? If you don't have the knowledge, bring the person who has that knowledge. So, right? Always be closing, so keep the uh, deliverables very short so that they can see value. Because uh, if you actually look at Salesforce's history, uh, the reason why Salesforce was successful is because they did not sell like SAP, where they said, oh, you can give me $2 million up front forever, and we'll give you something that you'll find out one year later, right? Salesforce said, any one user per month. Uh, the cost of that, as you scale and scale this. That's very simple in human services. We don't usually go in and say, let me rip out everything in your ecosystem that has been working for the last hundred years, and you're not a leader, we're gonna change it, right? We try to sell smaller pieces, we just open the door. Let me show you the ROI on what you're investing, and then you grow into trust. So for us, we try to close the scope very quickly, very short, so that you get you know, you get to prove your talent within a short period of time. Earn more trust faster. It's easy. Give a little time, not to effort. It's usually happened to me, uh, where I used to say, oh, Mr. Customer, don't worry. Uh, don't get up to pay my services, I'll do a workshop for free. Right? Uh, got to a point where they expected that from me all the time. Right? So, give a little time. Uh, this is a very complex scenario. Maybe if I want to in a measured manner, uh, but we never say that, hey, here you go, here's my free services, or um, we'll give you a discount just because of whatever reason. So we try to make sure that the effort is not sold, but you know, sometimes you have to do it. So again, this is the vision. They need a face to solve it. So this is what we're trying to do. Right? We're trying to change um, how something is done. It's not audience going at the problem. Uh, it's not employees who are um, not happy with just doing the nine to five. So there are three different parts. How sales is done, how products are delivered, and how teams are managed. This is how we're going to change and solve things. Hopefully, very soon, we want to go with others out there. So one of the things that we want to take. And another thing, keep in mind, take affordable steps. All this sounds fancy. Yeah. Uh, all that sounds fancy, but Take a couple of steps. You don't have to start a 15 member team today. One at a time. Take a couple of steps every time. Make sure whatever step you're taking is affordable. Right? And this is something that I always had. Right? Uh, when I first started the company, uh, like people were asking, what are you going to do? Like, what have you failed? What's the worst that could happen? I'm coming to my shutdown, but I always knew I had a job, right? I'm secure. So that's my fourth step. So every time if you have a tough decision, make sure that, you know, ask yourself what's the worst that could happen. And that's how, at least as a CEO, that's what I think. What's the worst that could happen and how do I stop that from happening? Perfect. Right? That's it. Everything else in between, you can manage. So that's my mantra that I keep. And uh, yeah, what would this look like was it's easy. I never believe any success is easy because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So, uh, always try to ask in between, that's where the trick was. Yeah, so again, I'll try to wrap this up quickly because I know we're time, but um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things, which is, um, again, something that really holds close to my heart. Defining success is super easy, right? Everybody talks to you, you talk to customers, right? Yes, Mr. Customer, you take Salesforce or Sales Cloud. You reach here, right? Don't worry about it, right? Everybody, whatever you think, always we look at success and we say, yeah, the success, yeah, it's defining success is easy. But the toughest thing, something that I always try to do, is defining failure. What if it doesn't work out? 
And it's not a pessimistic view. It is again coming back to the view of making sure you cover your bases. How do you, even in a partnership, when we recently acquired a company, um, we're talking to them saying, hey, we have, I don't know, um, two million pounds worth of revenue that's coming in every six months. Should be okay if you invest in us, right? So we ask, okay, what if it doesn't happen? What if you change your mind and you want to do something else tomorrow? So defining those failures will give you the full picture. So, um, and that also comes back to saying, you know, success does not happen overnight. I, I was sitting here talking to people here. Uh, this did not happen because of one person, or it did not happen because it was easy. Um, just from the perspective of mine, I travel 280 days a year out of 365. I love it, but it's not easy, right? Uh, some of my team members also are starting to follow in that footsteps. Um, there are a lot of people in our team, our execs, are always there for our team. If you're not able to do something, they will step in. So it does not happen overnight. Things don't happen because you did X, Y, and Z. You have to find that thing that's going to keep you driving long term. I would again do 300 nights this year, 300 days of travel this year. I would happily do it because I love what I do. So it doesn't happen overnight, so don't look at transaction. Look at transformation. Look at what's going to happen. What is the thing for you over the long, long term? Right? That, and again, uh, see growth patterns as you're doing good things, uh, and if your conscious is clean, you will see growth patterns. Making sure that you dream bigger is something important. That keeps us stopping to go further. Everybody will have this is something for my first uh, team leader position. I always thought that, oh, I know how to do it, so why can't you? Right? So always make sure that you know, some people are good at something, some people are not. So others will have difficult problems. As a leader, it's your responsibility to solve them. As a CEO, you need to be doing everything, accounting, cleaning the floor, cleaning the toilets, whatever it is, it is your company, it's your baby, right? So um, I was having a conversation with one of my CEO friends, uh, we were discussing, as a CEO, you're not a boss, you're a babysitter. You need to make sure, you know, they're fed well, their mental health is really well, and you know, they get the food at the right time, they get the salary at the right time, this is your job. So make sure you know what you're signing up for, right? Yeah, and the reason I, I'll talk about just this, because I think I've talked about those. Um, when I started off my company, I didn't know what business was. Okay? None of my family members ever did business. There was no advisor to me. Um, the advisor actually was Johan. So when I made the decision that I want to start the company, I went to the Trailblazer community, which was called, I think, Answers Community or Success Community back then. I said, hey guys, I'm looking to actually start a company. I have no clue where to start. Can somebody help me? Or I don't even know whether I should start a company or join another company as a consultant. Uh, I was an MVP at that time, so we didn't have our own thing. Um, I think around seven people scheduled calls in the next two days with me. Gave their time out of the day. They're all very, very busy people. Gave their time out of the day to come and talk to me and say, hey, listen, this is what you need to think. Uh, people are looking up cash flow, which words that I've never heard of, right? Taxes that I have to do for nine countries now, uh, which is like crazy, because I never did my own taxes. Uh, but my company started with Yohana, so even now, we're very, very, very focused on Yohana. Uh, all of our team members, at least 20%, of your time should go back into the sales force of HANA, apart from your ETO. Uh, if you're a user group leader, you get paid with pay raise. If you uh, became, become an MVP, of course, you get a pay raise. Uh, we're, we're incentivizing whatever way that you can give back to the community because uh, we always have a lot of customers who know us from the community because we're at events. Uh, we try to sponsor most of the events as well because we also do very large events in India, which I'll talk about in the contracts. But yeah. Uh, Ohana is something very, very important to us, and it actually has helped me understand how to do business, how to talk to people, and scale from there as well. So that's something that's very, uh, but yeah, I know that we're close out of time, so I'm going to skip some of these. I'll share these slides with you guys. Uh, but these are things that we did talk about, right? Um, the stuff that you know you always learn from mistakes by making forward steps. Yeah.
I love my team. They're amazing and, you know, one of the reasons why I'm able to come to Bulgaria for like five days, everybody's working their asses off there on the big field. Because they take care of me because I take care of them, right? So a very simple finger. And I know this, this uh, session or this question is more of my perspective on how the team is. Um, I know urge you guys to definitely go talk to my team to understand um, you know, their perspective on the growth pattern, but this is just my experience and how I view things and how I think my team will set it as well. But yeah, um, this is our three pillars that we try to keep uh, very strong and I would be more than happy to discuss this as well. I think we did discuss this. Um, I will, this is my last slide, so I will spend five minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Alright. This is um, one of the slides I can tell you about um, the fancy stuff that you can do best. As a person, again, um, your company, your team will probably be a reflection, the culture that you build will be a reflection of who you are. Because that's why the vision is a lot of fancy. So, uh, I love the final things in life and I want the best out there every time. Uh, as you can see, I'm always dressing in the suit and my team also tries to follow that. Um, but we try to get the best offices out there, get the best swag, everything is there. So the good is you get the opportunity to do what you want. Being an entrepreneur, if you ask me what is the one thing that is different from being an employee versus an entrepreneur, is freedom. You get to do what you want to do, what you'd love to do, at your own terms, right? Flip side of it is the risks. You need to be up at night, right? Babysitting, right? When you cry, you need to be up at night, right? So, you will have long nights, you will have tough decisions to make. Sometimes, you know, again, the people in the street, sometimes when you find really amazing people, sometimes there are people who will look at you for a transactional reason. We'll try to see if they can get the edge over you. It is how you look at the world. You don't have to be pessimistic in terms of people. Uh, I believe, again, coming from India, I really do karma, right? Which is, if you intend good things, good things will come to you, right? So, I always try to make sure that I trust you first, and the only way it will break is if you give me a chance, or if you break my trust, that's when the only reason I will look at you with that. So I will always, the customers, employees, partners, everybody, uh, I try to apply that principle, but sometimes it, you know, you get a couple of bad hits and you have a clear idea, but um, some of the other aspects of this is if you're not doing finance, you will have to really learn your math because your job ultimately is gonna be kept for maintaining that cash flow is your job. Maybe you find a good partner who can do that, we'll be fine. We're talking from a solo entrepreneur as well. Um, looking at cash flow is super important, so I had to learn the hard way. Um, but yeah, it's fun. You get to build your city, your empire, your dreams. And trust me, it is worth it. So if you have doubts, don't worry. It will work out as long as you're doing the right thing. Right? That's all I'm going to say, guys. Thank you so much for your time.